pay your attention, but um, continue eating. You know what the practices we have here. I'd like to introduce to you our speaker this afternoon. That's uh, Bruce McBride. Uh, Bruce was um, born in Melbourne. Early childhood, lived years living in um, Harrison House in Spring Street in the city. Um, he studied architecture for a short while, but then I think he must have been tempted to um, the, the income stream or something because he moved into um, the business world or in particular catering for many years. So maybe Kerry could uh, get some advice from him. Not that we would need very much advice for catering. I think Craig House does it very well. Yeah. Um, he was a buyer for George's in Collins Street for a period there. He became curator and manager of Ripon League at Elstonwick. 1973 to 79, and he remained in the employ of the uh, National Trust for another 17 years. So upon retirement, Bruce was appointed an honorary curator of uh, the uh, Government House in Melbourne and a tour guide of the Melbourne Cricket Ground, plus various other volunteer positions. So that summary, I suppose, represents quite an achievement for a person um, in itself, but and would normally not require any further material, but in Bruce's case there is a lot more. <clears throat> so I'll give some more detail. So as a youngster living in Harrison Street, Spring Street, uh, along with his family activities, um, Bruce uh, had a rare perspective on Melbourne life, um, and as is uh, illustrated through many of his um, brushes with uh, iconic politicians and celebrities over those years, and if you read his book you'll get a good insight to those issues. <clears throat> He spent a large part of his working life uh, as a musical theatre actor and as a passionate supporter and long-serving volunteer of the National Trust of Victoria. His book, Marvellous Melbourne and Me, which I've discovered is out of print, we'll have to speak to George about that, uh, sorry to Bruce about that. Uh, it details um, not only the varied life of uh, Bruce, but also that of this city. It includes a rare collection of photographs, uh, references uh, to artifacts and memorabilia. His um, life on the stage, I guess is probably a fair way of describing it. Uh, he appeared on stage in 1952 uh, with the Heidelberg Theatre, and he went on to perform 151 productions over his, his duration in the theatre. And they were with all groups such as the Lyric Festival, uh, the White Horse, and the Elwood Theatre Company. In 1986, he founded the Musical Music Theatre Guild of Victoria, which now embraces over 80 companies. Uh, and uh, that uh, group supports 11 judges who travel uh, looking for uh, talent and uh, providing awards to, uh, to those people. In 1990, he was created a Knight of St John for community service, and in 2000, he received the Medal of the Order of Australia for his uh, contributions to uh, musical theatre. So I'd like you to join me in giving Bruce a real hearty Gregor yeah. House welcome. <laughs> David, that was a funny introduction. <laughs> Keep up with it now. I'll cut it short too. <laughs> yes, well, thank you, David, and uh, thank you for your hospitality today. Lovely. And also the friendship that. Um... That's it. Is that correct? No, just was concerned that you might. I couldn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> David, thank you very much indeed. This is a very long subject, and it can go on for two hours. It can, but I'll have to break it down because I know a lot of you need to get away. But uh, if David was kind enough to read out that, uh, well, I was born in Melbourne, and that was on the 3rd of September, 1926. So you can work that out for yourselves. If you know how old the Queen is, we're the same. We're the same. And um, I was taken home to a new house in Brighton. In Brighton. And I have a cutting out of the Herald of the 22nd of December, 1926, describing this estate of 17 houses, which um, was built by a firm called Dixon & Yorston, sort of the A.B. Jennings of the day. And uh, I was taken home there. Now, I used to 
love it in Brighton. Oh, incidentally, the 3rd of September was my birthday. Is my birthday. You know what else happened on the 3rd of September, don't you? But in 1939, when war was declared for the second time around. And uh, the 3rd of September 1945 was the first day we, re we knew real peace because Japan had officially sur surrendered the day before. And uh, David, I'd be rather surprised, if I may say with respect, that anybody knows what happened on the 3rd of September 1901. And it wasn't Federation. Anybody know? Pardon? The Federal Parliament Second Lord. No. Actually, it's the birth of our Australian flag. It was the first day it was flown from the dome of the Royal Exhibition Building. And the design which we have uh, was chosen out of 32,000 submissions. Designs. I hate to think what was on the other 31,999. Anyhow, it's the birth of the Australian flag. And I don't think anybody really knows, looking around, not here, um, that it is the birthday of the Australian flag, and uh, the Governor General of the day, um, Dean, Dean, um, Dean um, about 20 years ago, considered that uh, day to be known as Australia Flag Day. But nobody knows. Because um, you have a look around. You don't see many Australian flags fluttering away, do you? Very few. You'll find them on police stations, RSLs, bowling clubs, and those public utilities. But do you know where you will always see an Australian flag flying? Always. I can't pick it up myself. But I didn't hear anybody say it. Government House. No, no. Even the Government House one's not the Australian flag. That's the Government's flag. Yellow represents Australia, uh, Victoria's golden past and Victoria's golden future. No, every McDonald's. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> 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 oh, it's an American organisation, and we know how they uh, revere their flag, so they honour ours for us too. We have to say that a, a leaf out of their book every now and again. But look, I love giving it right, and this is state of 17 houses. The cutting in the hill went on to say, listen, listen, this, and it introduced, for the very first time, believe it or not, nature strips. Nature strips. Now, I bet you think we've always had nature strips, but we haven't. <laughs> you have a look around the earlier suburbs of Melbourne, East Melbourne, West Melbourne, Port Melbourne, um, South mm. Melbourne, Abbotsford, uh, Collingwood, all those areas have not got nature strips unless they've been introduced later. I'm not quite sure about parcels. Uh, why were they introduced? Because as cars drove by, they dislodged dust and the dust went out and the grass caught the dust before it went on further into your house. But now, gentlemen, I don't know whether you do it or whether your professional gardeners do it, they come along to your garden and bring out that blower machine <laughs> and everything goes out onto the road. Everything goes onto the road. Of course, the first car that goes past blows it all back in again. <laughs> it really is just a waste of time and money. But Brighton, I loved it with the tradesmen coming around, with their horse and cart. Particularly the ice man with that big block of ice wrapped in hessian on his shoulder to put into the ice chest. And then my sister and myself would run out to um, his cart to get a sliver of ice, chipped off that big block with the, the ice cream. It was just beautiful. Yes, everything delivered by horse and cart. And of course, you know what else was behind the horse and cart, don't you? A neighbour or two with a bucket and spade. It would help the garden grow. And the ice cream man used to come along in that, with that big cabinet on a reverse tricycle ringing his little bell. He wasn't Mr. Whippy. He'd ring his little bell. And my sister, I'd ask her, Mother, could we get an ice cream, please, Mum? Oh, she said, look, if you must, you must, and I really wish you wouldn't, you know, because he probably made that in the trough in his wash house. <laughs> and he probably did, too. But here we are today. Oh, I'm still here. I'm not affected by that. We didn't have health and safety regulations in those days. And you might remember the dustman came and there are about four men 
on that dust cart. They were mainly footballers because they had to run and pick up that dustbin and take it and put it into the back of the truck. They were forever on the run. And of course, you know that those dustbins were made out of tin. Yes, you could hear the clang on, on the pavement and that you always had to go and look for the lid somewhere. <laughs> but anyhow, that was it. And if I may say this, I'm getting a bit close to the knuckle here in a way. Um, my mother uh, used to be visited by a little French lady every second month, a Madame Sabre. And um, Madame Sabre was a hawker. Not a hooker, a hawker. <laughs> and Madame always wore a top coat and a pull-on hat no matter what the weather. And she was only about this high. And struggled with two globard suitcases. And in those globard suitcases were the most beautiful French table linen, napery and lingerie, all made in France. And my mother bought something from Madame once a month, once every second month. And I've still got it all. This. <laughs> oh, you're awake up, aren't you? <laughs> I give it out to have a look at it all. Oh. <laughs> look, Dad, sorry, I couldn't get into it. <laughs> the lingerie, really. The lingerie is, is, is beautiful. One day I'll have to find a bank for it somewhere along the way. But um, I was sent off with my sister to Furbank Girls Grammar School. <laughs> I was uh, six, and I was only there for six months actually, that's because scarlet fever came along, mm -hmm. and it was very drastic in those days, you don't hear of it today, scarlet fever, and uh, I had to be kept, oh, kept at home, my uh, sister was kept at home, couldn't go to school, and you were usually sent off to Fairfield Infectious Diseases Hospital, but I was obviously very precious, thank goodness, and uh, my parents brought in a nursing sister to take care of me at home. And I can still see that nursing sister and my mother struggling in my bedroom with a big galvanised tin tub full of steaming, boiling hot water into which they put the blankets and dump them and dump them and run them out and run them out to wrap me in to get the fever out. And as you can see, it worked. <laughs> like all those old remedies worked, didn't they? Would you remember the mustard plasters? Well, some of you might, some of you wouldn't put mustard plasters stuck on your chest. And if uh, my sister and I going to bed, mother said to her mother, oh, I'm getting a sore throat. Mm. Well, mum would say, look, don't worry, she'd get out a piece of flannelette, douse it in whiskey, a whiskey compress, wrap it around your throat. The smell of the whiskey knocked you out. And she got up next morning without a sore throat. It was amazing, actually. And I wonder whether you've heard this one, to ward off arthritis. I bet this has got you interested. <laughs> do tell, do tell. Do tell. <laughs> well, all you need to do is soak pitted prunes in gin and have two a night going to bed. Look, even if you've got arthritis, do it because it's beautiful. They are beautiful. Anyhow, the doctor of the day said, look, Bruce is never going to be well whilst you're living near the sea air. You'll have to think of moving away from the sea air. <laughs> it wasn't a joke then, but anyhow, my parents thought, well, I have to leave right for Bruce to say. Now, I'm going to touch on, I hope you don't mind, Australian rules football for a moment. I suppose you think to yourself, oh, not him too. <laughs> get away from it even here. But my father lived in Middle Park as a boy, and every Saturday morning he and nine other boys went to the Middle Park bars to have swims. And one of those boys had the name Frank Beaurepaire. Oh. Now that's a name a lot of you would uh, know, of course, and Olympic tyres and all the rest of it. And Frank wanted to go overseas to have a shop with his swimming titles. Did not have the money. So those boys used to put sixpence in a tin every Saturday morning to help him on his way. I'll come back to that, I mentioned it for a particular reason. My father became a chartered accountant and he became interested in a, a little football team down in Middle Park called the Leopolds. So he thought, oh well, I'll give them a hand, I'll do their books for them. Well, they were a bit impressed with that, so they made him their honorary secretary too. And those little Leopolds became the second 18 of what was the South Melbourne Football Club, Ooh, oh, now the Sydney Swans. Yes. And uh, so one thing led to another. So he became their honorary secretary too and their honorary treasurer. 
and a delegate to what was the Victorian Football League, now the AFL, in 1922. And in 1927, 28, uh, the VFL, oh, he was made vice president of the AFL in 1927, 28, the VFL required a new secretary, as they were called then, not CEOs as they are today. So he thought, oh, well, I may as well give it a go. So he applied for that position and got it out of 120 applicants. And that was a lot of applicants then, because the VFL was a struggling small organisation, believe it or not, and had great trouble with the Victorian Football Association. They were in competition. So he got the job on £500 a year, out of which he was expected to pay his staff. <laughs> Yes, that's all right, but, but it was such a small organisation, there's no staff. <laughs> you must have read my book. <laughs> you sounded like a smart man. <laughs> no staff. What do you think of that, Kerry? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, yes, so anyhow, he took up the position and had one little room in what was the Victorian Cricket Association building, which still stands on the corner of Flinders Street and Exhibition Street, it used to be known as Connors Place. There he was in this one little room. And he thought, now this is no good. I've got to get this organisation up and running. I need a secretary of my own. So he asked for some more money to employ a secretary, and he got a little more money, strange enough. Why I say that? Depression had hit us. But he got some more money and employed a lass by the name of Bonnie Brown. Now, I was telling Kerry, my father's Christian name was very unusual. It was likely L I K E L Y. You probably think to yourself, that can't be right. <laughs> but don't think to yourself, it can't be right, because it is. It was. <coughs> and it's a Scottish name, and in Scotland it's pronounced Lackley. And it was a habit of the Scots then, I don't know about now of the uh, uh, parents giving the surname of the godparent to the godchild. And he had a Mrs. Likely as a godmother. So he got Likely. <laughs> and he was known as Like, L-I-K-E, which suited him right down to the ground. He had a wonderful personality. It was just terrific. So there was Bonnie and Like in this little office, squashed in this little office, and uh, they said, well, that's no good. He's charged the responsibility of getting his organisation up and running. We need headquarters. So he asked his committee, could he go out and find some headquarters? Well, yes, you can, but be very careful because we have not got any money. So just watch it, so to speak. But he looked all around Jollymont. Uh, couldn't find what he wanted. He had two lovely houses still there. One's now turned into townhouses. The other one is a private residence. and. Uh, it was built for Mr. Jackson of Young and Jackson's. It's in Jollymont Road. But he kept on looking, and one day he found in Spring Street, opposite the Treasury Gardens, on the corner of Flinders Lane, a wonderful 24 room, solid red brick, double fronted, three story private residence, complete with ballroom. <coughs> complete with small garden. <laughs> this house was built in about 1904 for a doctor and wife in the garden of another seven room house, which the doctor retained to become staff rooms for his new house. Now the new house was, we call it Federation style today, was very Australian, red brick, and every piece of wood visible inside was Tasmanian black wood. The ballroom was fully panelled in it. Little gum nuts and gum leaves carved into the window frames outside. Uh, wrought iron balcony on the first floor joining two bay windows that all do represent gum nuts and gum leaves. Staircase windows were lead light, not stained glass, red light representing uh, Australian flora. And on it went. Now, when my father found it, it was boarded up and unoccupied. And um, we found out that the doctor and wife never ever lived in it. The staircase was being carved to represent Australian flora too, but only got halfway. 
and we were told that the doctor's wife was the artisan. So we only imagined that they must have had an almighty row and she decided to walk out and leave him. And they never ever occupied the house. And when Dad found it, was, uh, it had been used for dressmakers, let out dressmakers and the like. Uh, so he thought, this is a wonderful opportunity. It was on the market for 21 and a half thousand pounds. Now, I'm speaking of 1928. 21 and a half thousand pounds, which included another separate terrace house behind it, number 11 Flinders Lane. And that house, 11 Flinders Lane, was a very old house then. And if you look at the early photographs of Melbourne, you know what you're looking for. That house sits there all alone, with not another building around it. And it still had the fire insurance plaque on it. Uh, because in those days you insured your property against fire with the fire authority. And if they arrived and uh, didn't, it didn't have a plaque on, they were inclined to have to burn down. <laughs> if it had the plaque on it, of course, they did their utmost to save it. <laughs> so they thought, this is exactly what I want. I've had stables on the Flinders and etc. Uh, but he said, we haven't got the money. Look, I'll give it a go. So he made an appointment to see the doctor who owned it. It was a Dr. Boo. And this is a true story. Uh, I've had to repeat it to me many times. Uh, doctor, this is exactly what I want for my organisation. But he said, unfortunately, things are bad. Throughout the world, they're very bad here. And we have not got the money. But he said, I've got two pounds on me. <laughs> well, actually, that was quite a bit then. And do you know what the doctor said to him? Well, he said, listen, Brian, you have an honest face. I'll trust you. I'll accept that two pounds as a deposit, and we'll negotiate for it to pay the property off within 10 years. Well, who wouldn't clinch that deal? But the VFL committee were very annoyed with my father. <laughs> what have you done? How do you think we're going to pay for it? And Dad said, well, I don't know how we're going to pay for it either. <laughs> I've given him two pounds. So he said, then he thought, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll levy every member of every league football club sixpence a year. Like they just put in a 10 to send Frank overseas. And if you guessed it, those sixpences paid off that property within the required time of 10 years. And that became the headquarters of the Victorian Football League, number 31 Spring Street and he named it Harrison House. Now, why did he name it Harrison House? This is a history lesson. <laughs> Harrison House. H.E.A. Harrison is known as the father of Australian rules football. So everybody thinks he invented this game that all, all of us over. Most of us go crazy about every Saturday afternoon. Well, we did, didn't we? Friday night, Saturday yeah, afternoon, Sunday night, night on the <laughs> <laughs> It's enough to kill you. Yeah, <laughs> But uh, Mr. Harrison had a cousin by the name of Tom Wills, who lived in the Western District, you know? Good. Lived in the Western District with a, a well-to-do family, very large Aboriginal community. And the Aboriginals, and Tom used to play with them a game called Man Grook. They used to kick a little fur ball around made out of possum skin. So now you know what to do with possums. <laughs> and Tom played the game with them. Now, he was sent off to rugby school in England to further his education. And whilst there, um, he played rugby and soccer. When he came back here, he played cricket with the Melbourne Cricket Club. And uh, he thought, we have to keep fit during winter. We need a game to play of our own. So he called in his cousin, Mr. Harrison, and they worked on the rules of man group and rugby and soccer. And in 1858, they decided to try the game out and called in a team from Scotch College and one from Melbourne Grammar. They played over two weekends and neither of them kicked a goal. <laughs> but, wouldn't you know, Scotch College declared themselves the winner. Then in 1860, Tom became captain of the um, Melbourne Cricket Club. And in 1861, was charged with the responsibility in taking to England the all-Aboriginal cricket team 
which went to Australia, they went to England to represent you and I at cricket. And when they were there, they played rugby and soccer, <coughs> and they came back here. Tom and uh, Mr. Harrison sort of formalised those rules, and that's how we got Aussie rules football. So now you know. So the league moved in, and the caretakers with that original seven-roomed house, and the ballroom became the boardroom, and on it went. But there were still eight huge guest bedrooms on the top floor Dad didn't have any use for. Getting away from the sea air, the doctor said. So, my father said, look, we have to leave Brighton for his sake. I'm not using those rooms. We'll just convert them into a flat temporarily until we decide where to settle down permanently. So we settled down there temporarily for 30 years, <laughs> living above the shop. But I've told a fib because um, when during the war, when Japan came into the war, and you most of you would remember, they came down upon us, and uh, we had the uh, bombing of Darwin, then we got the Brisbane line, and those little subs got into Sydney Harbour. And my father, who had a lot to do with the war effort, was told there was a Japanese reconnaissance plane flying over Melbourne, having a look at us, which has been proven. I don't know whether you know that that plane was launched from a submarine in Bass Strait. How on earth they did it, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And had a look at us, then went back and ditched the plane, and the pilot was pulled out, and off they went again. And Dad thought, oh, gosh, if they bomb Melbourne, we'll be the first to go up. So he thought he'd better move us out of Melbourne as far away as possible for safety. So he bought a house at Eaglemont. Just six miles away. <laughs> and we felt perfectly safe up there on Mount Eagle, looking right over Doncaster, Templestone, McLeod, Rosanna. All you could see was sheep, cows, some orchards, Smith's Dairy at Templestone, and the Templestone Brickworks. So much so, the RAAF spotted this, and they practiced star bombing along there every day. <laughs> so Dad was right, you see. We felt perfectly safe. <laughs> Still loving the once a lovely spot. We moved back into the city when the war was over. But having been to Furbank Girls Grammar School, my sister was sent off to Merton Hall, and mother and dad wanted me to go off to Melbourne uh, Grammar School, Boys Grammar School. And the same doctor said, incidentally, that doctor was a Dr. William C. McClellan. There's the W. C. McClellan cricket trophy. Um, he was president of both the Melbourne Cricket Club and the Victorian Football League at the same time. I don't think you'd find one man occupying those two prominent sporting <laughs> organisations together again. Uh, getting away from the sea air. Um, oh, no, sorry, I've done that. Uh, <laughs> came off to Melbourne Grammar School, and that same doctor said, Look, that's all very well, but Bruce is very run down. He's very weak. He's had a very tough time with scarlet fever. Send him to a state school first and get him roughed up. <laughs> so that's why I'm looking roughed up. <laughs> For three years, I went down to the Yarra Park State School in the corner of Punt Road and Bridge Road, Richmond. The buildings are still there, but they're now townhouses. And I had a wonderful time there, particularly at lunchtime, because the first shop in Bridge Road was the lolly shop. And what could you get in a lolly shop all those years ago? White Knight, Silver Sticks, a Marshmallow, Chocolate Covered Guns, Sherbet bags that made your coffin splutter when the sherbet got through that thickery straw. <laughs> and if you had a rainbow or cricket ball and dribbled, that all changed colour down here, all red or blue. My mother had a horrid time with my shirts. But along a bit further, and I apologise if this offends anybody, along a bit further was the Chinese laundry. We used to have a lot of Chinese laundries around Melbourne, and uh, they did wonderful work with the shirts and collars, etc. But there was always a bit of a problem with that Chinaman, because some child in your class would have said to you, you want to be very careful walking past the Chinaman today. He'll come out and grab you, and he'll put you in a basket <laughs> and send you back to China. You'll never, ever be seen again. <laughs> that was a terrible problem. Whereas, ladies, I'm told, if you went to my ladies' lounge in Collins Street, <laughs> where would you finish up? in South America for the white slave trade. <laughs> we were always told, you be very careful when you go into those one-hour cinema theatrettes because they're, per they're permanent showing and they're always in the dark. And there's always men in there in overcoats. <laughs> we had some problems, really, then. Anyhow, <laughs> I've never been to China or any of those places. But walking home, I'd go past Cliveden, where the Hilton Hotel now stands, 
that wonderful house built for Sir William and Lady Clark. And uh, you know that they lived at Rupert's Wood at Sunbury, where the, you know, the ashes started off. And uh, Willie was absolutely president of every organisation in Melbourne. And he decided that he was president of the Great International Exposition, for which the exhibition in the building was built. Excuse me. And I think you probably know <laughs> that that is one of only two buildings <coughs> left in the world that were built to house exhibitions. It always, it always worries me that somebody put a match under those big wooden doors one day, and up it would go. It's a very important building. Um, but he was chairman of that. And he thought, well, you better build a townhouse, really. Oh, no, I'm not thinking. Thanks very much. Um, I'm getting ready to sing to you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you <have> to drink <laughs> up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You've got to me. <laughs> 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 you better build a townhouse. Town so he built Cliveden. And I don't know if you've been to Rupert's Wood. Yes. Have you? Yes. And I don't know whether it's explained to you that that vast house of 52 rooms, two story, with um, 20 foot high ceilings, the architect completely forgot it would need a staircase to get upstairs. <laughs> was built without a staircase. Now, there is a staircase there, and it's crammed into the main hall. It covers up a lovely stained glass window, and it would be the, well, the second steepest staircase I have ever encountered, because they didn't have the room to get it up gradually to cope with the 20 foot high ceilings. The steepest I've ever encountered is in Government House, Melbourne, it, which has got a second tower called the Virgin's Tower, why the Virgin's Town? Well, when it was first built in the 1870s, incidentally, I don't know whether you know, that um, uh, the British um, hierarchy, they saw three positions. The Governor-General of Canada, the Viceroy of India, and the Governor of the State of Victoria. So important we were. We got that marvellous residence there. But the tower, the Virgin's Town, three floors of little dormitories, got windows looking over the Royal Botanic Gardens, and that's where um, maids or female staff, if they were brought in to do extra duty, could sleep there overnight if they wished, but the staircase is like that. It is so <laughs> steep. Do you ever notice it's difficult to come down the staircase? Not so bad going up, but coming down. Um, look, I'm going all over the place, and I'm never going to finish this, but one of those staircases I was in England in 1954 and was invited to go to a, a conference at the House of Parliament to represent Australia, believe it or not. And um, well, there were 22 of us, and we were still classed as the colonies then. And the, uh, the other people were from uh, the likes of Ghana, Ivory Coast, uh, Ceylon, mm -hmm. Malaya, um, Kenya, Uganda, and here was little Bruce from Australia. And uh, the High Commissioner asked me if I could go to this conference. And we were given little uh, blue discs to wear, which admitted us to any part of the House of Parliament that we wanted to go without being challenged. But as a parting gesture, we were uh, told, now we're going to take you up to meet Big Ben. <laughs> well, because Big Ben was never available to the public, so off we went. It's a spiral staircase to get up there. <coughs> They're hard to get up, but worse to come down. <laughs> Anyhow, we got up into the clock room, the clock face room, where there's four, right? They are absolutely huge. And we were asked, please don't look at your watches. We had to go up further to Ben. And uh, we saw the clock was saying 10 to 3. So we got up to Ben, and there was Ben in this open belfry, right in front of us. And we thought, he's going to strike any minute. We'd better hang on. Well, he struck. It went right over your head. Absolutely amazing. You may as well have not heard it at all. Went right over your head. Can be heard 10 miles away, but um, it was an experience and a half. Now, I lost my track now. Cliveden. Cliveden, Cleveland or Clifton. So he decided to build Clifton because he had so much going on with Clark. And so he built it and he was going to cater for a lot of visitors. So, guess how many guest bedrooms? He installed in that house no less than 23 guest bedrooms. He had 12 children, there was himself and the missus, so there was a lot of bedrooms in that house. Two ballrooms, 
one massive ballroom, and the smaller one was just a little bit bigger than this room, which doubled up as a supper room. And he had a private entrance and a public entrance. Now, he got information once he built that uh, station that the Victorian Railway, as it was, they were going to alter the train line from Flinders Street to Clifton Hill, where it runs today. It used to go a slightly different way. And it uh, was going to go past, through Yarra Park. And he thought, now that's going to go past my house. Hmm. They'll have to put a station here somewhere. What say I offer to pay for the station if they'll build it opposite my front door? Yeah. And of course, the Jolly Mont Railway Station was built immediately opposite his front door, which would have made it easy for himself, family, guests and friends to get in and out of the city on the train. But do you know what? He was a clever man, but he made a miscalculation because he died suddenly on a tram. <laughs> when you think he was going to die on public transport, he would have chosen a train. <laughs> but he died before that station was fully built. But then he had organised, please, when you build that station, whatever you do, please don't put any advertising on it. That would be very offensive to myself, family, guests and friends. And it's only for the last couple of years that advertising has appeared on the Jollymont Railway Station. They can't leave a thing alone today, can they, with commercial graffiti. <laughs> And one lady said to me recently with Melbourne trams, she's not quite sure where the door is. They're travelling advertising hoardings, really, that's what, that's what they are. But um, I got out the car one day to make sure there wasn't a little sign there which would have told me one mile to Griffith Brothers Tea, <laughs> because when we travelled in Victoria, all we had to do was look at the Griffith Brothers Tea sign, see how far we were from Melbourne. That wasn't there. Now, Mr. and Mrs. Griffith uh, are interesting people. They were the proprietors of Griffith Brothers Tea, and some of you might remember that their tea was marketed as Green Signal and Red Signal Tea. And they were Anglicans, very religious. Charles built a college for the training of Anglican deaconesses on the corner of Clarendon Street and Albert Street, East Melbourne, the building is still there. Uh, and they put an Asheville tennis court in there for the would-be deaconesses to have a hit. And they felt like having a hit. And I noticed these girls never feel like having a hit. And that Asheville tennis court went to rack and ruin. And I said to Dad one day, Dad, look, they're not using that tennis court. Do you think you could inquire if you could buy just the tennis court? Then we could build a house on there and build move out of Melbourne, silly idea. But my sister and I were always putting ideas into my father's head because we knew he'd work on them. And I forgot about it. And one day he came to me and said, Bruce, hmm, I've been to the Diocesan office in St Paul's Cathedral. She on that tennis court. He said, I can't do anything about it, I'm afraid, because Mr. and Mrs. Griffith placed a covenant <coughs> on that property that it cannot be sold until the second coming of Christ. Unfortunately, <laughs> 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 the wind right out of my side. <laughs> It'll blow the wind out of your sails, so when I, when I tell you, it was, a, it was eventually sold. Then it was. It became the officers of Bates Martin, the country, the architects, is now the officers of the Police Association. And walking down through the Fitzroy Gardens, Kira, do you want to get away? I have to go soon, thank you. <laughs> I will. I'm, I'm dreadfully sorry for uh, That's okay. interrupting. Thank I'm you. glad to know you're sorry. absorbed as well. Thanks for coming to Bye. Um, I have to be quick. Well, I don't see anyone complaining about the time. You didn't buy the house. Uh -oh. You didn't buy the house. I'm sorry. You, you missed buy. out on the house. That's your tennis last court. Oh, tennis court. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but then, uh, my father said to me in March 1934, uh, look, on the way home from school, I was walking through the Fitzroy Gardens, on the way home from school, you'll find some trucks coming in there. Just wait and see. So, I did. And there were little Ford tray trucks. And on the back of them, they had these huge baskets of straw. And I thought, that's not little boys packed in there going back to China. <laughs> That's Captain Cook's cottage in there, oh, coming out to be rebuilt in the Fitzroy Gardens to celebrate the centenary of Melbourne. And I used to talk to the builders and they told me all about it, etc. Then it was all finished, all done, all completed for its opening in November 1934. And um, it is all authentic. 
if you can visualise it, it has ivy growing on the walls outside. Even that ivy came out from England with the bricks and stones and floorboards and shingles, etc. The roots I'm speaking of. The only thing that's not authentic really, Jimmy didn't live in it, did he? <laughs> <laughs> Mum and Dad did. But up went the flag, up there. there's the, uh, there's the Union Jack, but it's not. It's the Union flag, the flag of England, the reign of George III, when that cottage was originally built in Great Ayrton in Yorkshire. And the lady who owned it and Sir Russell wanted to purchase it had to con be convinced that Australia was part of the British Empire before she was allowed to be <laughs> here. Then at times, oh, talk about the flag, I tiptoe home through the gardens, not through the tulips, through the gardens, because I thought I'm walking on the flag, because you, I'm sure you know, that James Sinclair, who designed the gardens and lived in that little house behind Captain Cook's cottage, which is now an information bureau, he laid them out to represent the Union Jack and those avenues of elms represent the arms of the Union Jack. Lansdowne Street between the two gardens, twice a year, that was blocked off by the police with the big white painted wooden barricades. That's where you could go and test the brakes of your car. Mm -hmm. The police made two life-size figures out of Ethan. Stiff arms, stiff legs, to look like you and I, if I may say. And they called one of them Heedless Hebe and the other one Willie Everlearn. <laughs> you got in your car at the top of Lansdowne Street down, you came in somewhere along the way, they threw either Hebe or Willie Everlearn out in front of you. Mm -hmm. And if you happened to hit them, that's how you had to go and have your brakes tested. That's what we did in those days. Mm -hmm. Then get home to see how high the spires have grown on St. Patrick's Cathedral, because they were built in 1939. And uh, if you can visualise that main spire, which actually wasn't meant to be there in the first place, but because of sectarianism, and St Paul had put his on, so Patrick thought he'd better put his spire on. <laughs> and uh, I won't go into that subject. And um, uh, it's got a bronze crucifix on the top. And have you ever noticed it's got a light off on that bronze crucifix to warn aircraft? And I could lie in bed, Looking at the, at the window, the stars and that light sort of twinkling. And I thought to myself, when they go and turn that on tomorrow night, it mightn't go on because it'll need a new globe. How are they going to change the globe? Have you ever thought how they change the globe? David, do you know this one? No, I don't. With a hand, I suppose. Probably <laughs> <laughs> access it. Yes. Well, there's, there's 70 foot of that mm. summit of it is uh, solid concrete <clears throat> but there is an opening comes through the middle of it mm. and you go up a spiral staircase till you couldn't go any further you would hit your head on the base of a platform or the base of the 70 foot of concrete there's a platform and you'll find there's a winch there you wind the winch and the globe comes down attached on a pole <laughs> through the little hole to meet you put a new globe in wind up up it goes and fix itself on top of the crucifix wow. that's how it's done simple isn't it mm. But that man had to get himself up there, and there would have been a wooden scaffolding around the spot. But he had to strap a ladder onto that crucifix and get himself up there to make sure his fitment worked and his little invention to stop birds and bees getting in there and making a home also worked. And he guaranteed that light would be seen 40 miles away. Well, nobody really believed him. So the church authorities put somebody nearby in Brunswick somebody uh, in Bermorris and somebody up on Mount Daniel. And they all phoned in, well they can see it. Two days later, a lady living in Mount Macedon, 38 miles from Melbourne, phoned in to say, thought you might be interested to know that I can see the light. And she meant that light on the top of the spot. Just amazing. It's out now, so don't go looking for it. And I think I'd better go up and tell them how to do it. But because of radar, it is not necessary. And the same man, uh, Mr. Barnes installed the same apparatus for the flagpole on the TNG building in Collins oh, Street. Sure. Mm -hmm. The TNG building, Temperance and General Life Insurance, people used to say, oh no, it doesn't. It stands for try and get it. Insurance <laughs> <laughs> company. And you know, all the dentists of Melbourne had their surgeries in there, didn't they? <laughs> so what else was it referred to? Touch and go, <laughs> tickle and giggle, <laughs> and teeth and gums. <laughs> I had many a go at my teeth on the fifth floor. You got in the lift there and it took off. It was the first high-speed lift in Australia. A little brass plate told you how, how high it rose per second. K 
coming down, you left everything in the dentist's chair. <laughs> so you wanted a cup of tea. So he went further down to the basement to Russell Collins. I'm sure a lot of you would remember Russell Collins, that wonderful cafeteria. I went down there many times for a particular reason. Uh, because when you got down into the foyer, you might remember those who went down there, ahead of you were double glass doors into the restaurant. But as you got to about five feet of those, they just slid open. You know, there's nobody to think. Who did that? <laughs> they were the first self opening doors of this type in the world at the TNG building. Now, for the ladies' benefit, and I'm sorry about this, men, for the ladies' benefit, my, if my mother wanted a new pair of gloves, she would sure ask me if I'd like to come to get a pair of gloves with mum. I'd love to get a pair of gloves with mum. And my father was a member of parliament too, and in those days there was a big social program, like the mayoral balls and the debutant balls and all the rest. A lot of gloves were required. So we'd go down to Bourne Welsh from Flinders Street to be greeted by a floor walker in full morning suit. Cutaway tailcoat, striped trousers, red button on. You got that at the mutual store, the old Craig Williamson's and Duck Green Nuns too. This way I made into a glove counter. Fancy finding a glove counter today. <laughs> Fancy finding a counter chair to sit on. <laughs> you pick yourself up. And then ladies, you'd remember what happened. The attendant would push that little round velvet cushion along for Madam to put her elbow on. Yes. Would you pinch your fist please, Mel? Oh, the rings will have to come off though. Yes. Into a little glass dish. Would you clench your fist pattern to measure across here, get the size of the glove? Then they're mainly kid gloves, they've taken out of a box, and that kid sort of sticks together. And like we used to blow up a paper bag and go bang, give everybody a truck, the attendant would pull the gloves out and go into the glove, and finger, fingers hopefully would pop out. If they didn't, it was hard to get on. Don't worry, man, and out came the powder puffer. <laughs> Get them on, drop them on. Yes, that's fine, thank you. Then a bit hard to get off. Ooh, out came the wooden stretcher to stretch them. <laughs> then they were delivered home free of charge by a fully uniformed driver. Then the white ones had to go off to Goose to be dry cleaned. And he arrived in this wonderful outfit, set in green, bre uh, breeches, black leather leggings, black leather gloves, tunic with gold epaulettes, and a green cap. That was the dry cleaner. For the men's sake, Dad said to me, go down to Bruce's factory, Normandy Street, he's going to fit you for a Melbourne Star bike. I said, Dad, you fit you for a bike? Yes, go down, Bruce will look after you. Speaking of Bruce Small, who yes. made famous the... Um, oh, the boss is coming. It'll we'll finish up any minute. I've just, I've just got two things. Yeah, keep going, keep going. All right. Um, in Melbourne Star bike. Bruce Small made a fortune out of it with Oppie, of course, but he didn't actually start the Melbourne Star. Who did? And Mr. Finnegan, in Glenferry Road, Melbourne, had a bike shop making bikes. He didn't have a name for his bike, but he did have tattoos on his arms, amongst them was a star. And one day the sun shone through the window and hit the area sort of where the star was. He said, Robert, hmm, look at that, that's interesting. I haven't got a name for my bike. Oh, I think I'll call it the Star. I'm in Melbourne, I'll call it Melbourne Star. And that's how it's got its name. So, to finish up, there's lots more we could cover, but that's enough. But to finish up, I used to get on that bike on a Sunday morning and run around the city look at all the wonderful things we had. And the building, I suppose, which intrigued me the most, and still does, is the Flinders Street Railway Station. Now, I don't know if you know, that um, at the turn of the century, there was a competition for a new station in Bombay, Mumbai, India. And two railway architects here submitted a design for it and did not win. But if you know Mumbai, there are three railway stations there. One of them's not unlike the Flinders Street Railway Station. So there was a, they needed the Flinders Street Railway Station, so they rejigged their design and we got Flinders Street Railway Station. And if you know anything about architecture, there's an influence of Indian architecture in the Flinders Street Railway Station, that, although the dome represents the Dome of St Paul's in London. Anyhow, that long, 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 long building goes on forever. The builders from Williamstown, the Thompson Brothers, the polished granite, 
bluestone, then all brick. They got up to the first floor, putting all these bricks together, having a great time, putting all these bricks together. But they suddenly stopped because they thought, oh, something's something wrong here. Those two architects completely forgot that long, 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 long building would require a passage. It was just all rooms, no <laughs> passage. So they couldn't pull it down and start again, so they finished it without the passage. Then they had to stick a passage on the outside, and I'm speaking of the south, uh, south side overlooking the river. They finished the building without it, then they cantilevered it with a wooden frame, a big wooden frame out to cover that hole there from the clock tower to the dome tower. Then they couldn't face it with bricks because there's nothing to hold the bricks up. If you go into number one platform, just look up, you can see it, it's got a wooden brick ceiling. Uh, so there's a um, nailed tin sheeting on it, that was light. Then they cut the windows out, which were going to be, and they had to turn what were going to be windows into doors to get into the passage. Then they thought, well, what are we going to do to cover up the mistake? People will see that that's only tin. Somebody must have suggested, well, why don't you paint little bricks on the tin to match the real bricks? And that's exactly what they did. Paint little bricks on the tin. It's now been repainted several times, and they've never repainted the bricks. But if you're on number two or four platform, you might wonder why that's not a brick wall along there. Well, that's the reason for it. The Flinders Ridge Railway Station. Now, if we could go on forever, that's enough. Yes, I wrote a book, it's out of print. Um, this was the cover of it. Yeah. And that's, that is actually Spring Street. That lamp is outside the Treasury Building still. And that's the statue of Sir William Clark, still there. And this house here, right in the middle, is the one which my father purchased for 21 and a half thousand pounds. So, marvellous Melbourne and me. I've had a lovely time in Melbourne, the whole 85 years up to date. But there's a few more to go. Thank you very much for being so attentive. I'm sure there's about 100 questions out there, but we'll have to keep it fairly short, I think. Yes, that's all right. Um, maybe there are three questions. Who'd like to be first? May I first? Uh, <coughs> I'm very happy to hear from you again, of course. My name is Bruce as well. That's very nice. Is it like Bruce? Yes. That's very good. But uh, also, David McIntyre was a very, he's a very good friend of mine. An excellent friend of mine. Peter. Or David? Peter McIntyre. Peter McIntyre. Peter McIntyre. Peter McIntyre. Because he was head of the um, department for a while, I think like that. Yes. And uh, I remember him very well. I still keep getting up with him. And he's now 85. Are you 85 as well? Yes. Same as the Queen. Well, we should be 86 in a week's time. Mm. Well, I can't beat you on those occasions. <laughs> That's the life of it, all I can say. It's, it's Peter McIntyre are a good friend. Yes. That. There was a good article on him in the Age the other day. I, I read that. Yes. Yes, yes. yes Aaron. Uh, a, a brief uh, view of the cable tram system, which uh, hmm. was so much in evidence when you were younger. I'd be interested to hear your comments about it. Well, it was wonderful, wonderful to have a ride on the cable trams, of course. And on a Saturday night, uh, we had four dogs when we were living in Spring Street, believe it or not. Four dogs, and one of them, an Airedale, could be let out at 7 o'clock in the morning, take himself across Spring Street, walk himself in the gardens, came back himself across Spring Street, back home, and he eventually died of natural causes. <laughs> <laughs> but on a Saturday night, Darren, our parents would take us up to have a ride on the cable trams. When we had a spotty, uh, we'd take the spotty too. And we'd sit on the front of the dummy, and get on at the corner of Burke Street and Spring Street to go up Nicholson Street. And we were always told, or sometimes we were asked to get out and push because it couldn't pick up the table to go around the corners. And um, other times coming back down, uh, you were told to hang on. <laughs> you could have gone off, <laughs> fallen off. But they were a marvellous institution. It's a great shame that we did not keep one, keep one, like they have in San Francisco. It would have been a wonderful, uh, draw card uh, and of course the wonderful 
uh, cable house is still there, mm. opposite the exhibition building. A marvelous building, and it's still there, the cable house. All the other cable houses are gone, except one's been converted into a hotel down in Richmond. But um, yeah, they're an institution and a half, the cable chain, and they moved people just to say, and you could actually hop on and hop off when it's going mm. on the dump, on the dummy in the front. So Barbara, did you have a question? Me? Did, oh, did I see your hand up before? Just quickly on that, in, back in my family somewhere, there's, I don't know how true it is, but uh, apparently my grandfather drove okay. the first cable car from St Kilda, St Kilda Beach, yes. down to wherever it finished or vice versa. And he's supposed to, there's photos somewhere in the family, and he drove the first one. Try and cable car it. from... Uh, it's worth recording those things, you yeah, can. Yeah. Worth, worth recording. Um, that was the biggest... Um, uh, cable system in the world. Mm -hmm. mm. We had it all. We did. Well, you know, this well, yes, it's my turn now. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> Bruce could have probably told his, uh, his talk as a uh, travel back in time because clearly that's what it was for many of us. If, um, we can remember some of the things he, he spoke about. Um, you know, he, he sort of introduced themes to us which we probably forgot about or hadn't even noticed, such as McDonald's being the greatest promoter of the Australian flag. Um, <clears throat> and of course, uh, a flag day, which, yes, I must admit, um, it's in my mind if I ever had known it. Um, <clears throat> but the reminiscences that he's given us have been um, terrific, really. They've um, introduced a few words which most of us have probably forgotten about, like, you know, sixpence and uh, South Melbourne Football Club, <laughs> 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 the pound. Um, Harrison is the founder of the Australian Rules uh, Football. Uh, Sherbet Straws, uh, Griffiths T signs, or railway lines. I mean, uh, sort of many of them we've, we've heard this afternoon. Uh, and I think we've probably only really had chapter one of Bruce's talk. <laughs> so there's 24 chapters. <laughs> <laughs> Bring him back. Yes, that's what I think. I'm sure that we'll um, be very keen to, yeah. to welcome him back. Yes. Uh, many times. You've been a very fascinating presentation. Yes. Um, so, um, with that, we've got a couple of small mementos here for you, Bruce. We have? Um, yes, we've got a, another biro for your memoirs. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, and this, we were talking about our relative age earlier on, Bruce and I, and, uh, and how it sort of has its effect on our person, you know. And, and so with, in here there is a liquid which is very beneficial if you're getting old. If you take it in sufficient proportions, it gives you a very nice warm feeling and makes you feel young. Is it good for arthritis? <laughs> 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 it's it's if you've been all that trouble, I'm going to take it. Uh, yes, I think it's really good. It's worth the weight in gold, I'm sure. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. We have the second of the diabetes series which our CEO of Dr. is presenting coming up um, on the 11th of April. Uh, I think uh, David Blair and I in this room have been to the, to the first one and found them very, very interesting. A, a great wake-up call. Here is clearly very knowledgeable on that issue also. We have um, on the 15th of April, only a couple of weeks away, the next of the Sunday um, music sorrows. Um, that's at Wilma and Friends. It's had a write up in the uh, monthly newsletters, just, just as a reminder for you, to this time. Uh, also, in keeping with more activities in Bradford House for us members to attend and the, the sort of mental stimulus we like to provide to our members, we have the, the second of what's called the monthly argument. This is a debating group that now uses our facilities. I didn't get to the first one, but I've been told it was very um, entertaining. Their subject. This time is the Frankston Report, a threat to freedom of speech. <clears throat> and uh, we continue to have the Friday night drink sessions where members just gather informally out here in the, in the bar area and chat on and then have a meal together and just a, a, a catch up. So uh, that's on the Friday the 13th of April. So thank you very much everyone for that and um, I look forward to seeing you again in a month's time. Thank you.